Hello everyone. Welcome to the live stream. You are watching the Piedmont Trails channel and tonight I will be speaking about the Great Wagon Road. Mainly in southern Virginia and in northern sections of North Carolina. My name is Carol. I want to welcome everyone to our live presentation. The chat is open and ready. So feel free to let me know that you're here. Say hi to me. Tell me where you're from. Uh, type in your questions and comments and suggestions, and um, we'll get started with the live stream. All of our live streams take place in the attic of Piedmont Trails. And to learn more about what we are all about, I encourage you to visit PiedmontTrails.com. Tonight's segment is uh, part of our Great Wagon Road project. This project dates to June of 2019 and is comprised of volunteers dedicated to naming the Great Wagon Road as a National Historic Trail. To learn more about the project, you may can visit the Piedmont Trails website and click on the Great Wagon Road Project link. And it will tell you all the details about the project and what we are all about. And I also want to share with you tonight, there's a, um, this is a picture of our flyer. And if you would like to have this to share with your friends or family or with your library where, or genealogy friends, then just let me know. And I'll be happy to email that to you. You can just um, send an email courtesy of PiedmontTrails.com and just contact us that way. And we'll make sure that you get a copy of our flyer. The time period for tonight's topic is 1745 through 1760. So let's get started with tonight's stream. And I will stop periodically and um, catch your comments and answer your questions the best that I can. And we've got Brian Cheryl. Hello, I'm here in present. Hello, Brian, and welcome. Welcome to the live stream. I'm going to begin in a little town called Daleville, Virginia. And I'm going to spell it for you guys. It's D-A-L-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Daleville. This little town is just located just outside of present-day Roanoke. It's a little bit north of Roanoke. The Great Wagon Road from this point travels south to the Blue Ridge Airport. Have you all have you all heard of the Blue Ridge Airport? This is located near Horse Pasture Creek. Travel to the North Mayo River and continue south to the North Carolina border at the Stokes County boundary. There are many many shootouts along the way. And what are shootouts? Shootouts for us road historians, we call them, are um, alternate routes or cutaways that derive from the original route and go elsewhere. And these cutouts or alternate routes, they may go around an area and then eventually join back into the original road. Portions of the original roadbed can be found in several areas in southern Virginia, mainly near the Mayo River and from the Mayo River going south to the Dan River. Majority of this um, location is rural and has been for many, many years. It's a farming community. Um, it hasn't built up like other sections of um, southern Virginia or in North Carolina has. And you can still view several locations of the original roadbed of the Great Wagon Road. The Moravians initially, if you're, if you're using the Moravian Diaries, let me back up and say this. If you're using the Moravian Diaries as a resource tool um, to research further with the Great Wagon Road, I want to clarify with, with everyone that the Moravians initially got lost on on one of these alternate routes that I had just brought up, one of the cutouts, the shootouts. And they were able to rejoin the road again in the vicinity of Wart Mountain, and that's W-A-R-T Mountain. This is in Virginia. This location of where the Moravians, um, this is where they actually climbed in elevation, and they were actually to reach the top of this point and view to the south and view Pilot Mountain, today Pilot Mountain, in 1752. And then they were able to um, get back on the original roadbed and find their way down to where they wanted to be. 
the location of where the Moravians were can be seen on an old um, farm dirt road today. And it's leading off of Highway 823. And I'll repeat that. That's Virginia Highway 823 or Pratt Road. And that is P-R-A-T-T, -T, Pratt Road. I love going through the Moravian Diaries because um, they go into so much detail of when they traveled, how they traveled, who uh, traveled with them, where did they stop along the way. Um, and the Moravians were very well known to have traveled the Great Wagon Road several different periods during the 18th century. And it was for various reasons. Mainly they were bringing in uh, families from Pennsylvania to settle into their North Carolina settlements. But a lot of times they were using this route to go back and forth for supplies as well. And this was before the, um, before the Cape Fear Road became into existence from North Carolina. After that, then the Moravians pretty much, and, all, and everyone used the Cape Fear Road after that. And I'll get into the Cape Fear Road at the end of the segment tonight. But let me get back on target here. There is another diary that is dated 1743, and it's by Leonard Chanel. And I'm going to spell this last name for you. It's S-C-H-N-E-L-L. -L. He is a Moravian minister. He traveled the Great Wagon Road several times back and forth during this time period of 1743, visiting the Georgia settlements. This was before the failure of the Georgia settlements down in um, by the Moravians. He would leave the Great Wagon Road somewhere near the vicinity of Smith River, which was known on earlier maps as Urban River, named by William Byrd. And he would use the Trader's Path until he reached the King's Highway by way of Charleston, South Carolina. And then from that point on, he went further south to the Moravian, Georgia settlements. If you ever have a chance and you're looking into... Um, details of the road dating from this time period of 1743. I urge you to look closely at Leonard Chanel's diaries. John Peter Salling, I'm going to spell the last name here, it's S-A-L-L-I-N-G, discovered the Nash Natural Bridge and Cedar Creek where the road passes nearby in 1739. George Washington's initials can be found there and Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson surveyed the area around circa 1750. The year of 1746 witnessed the first of many, many families traveling the road into North Carolina. And there's a reason for this. If you know, this is with any genealogy project that I've ever worked on with my own personal family tree. If you follow the history of the local area in which you're researching, you will know where the records are. You will know how they were stored, how they were gathered. The year of 1746 was the first of uh, many families traveling the Great Wagon Road. And why is this? Because history tells us that King George's War, which existed between 1744 through 1748, recruited men for militia duty. It was a requirement. Throughout all of the colonies, with the exception of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. This is a prime reason, one of the prime reasons why families were leaving Virginia, who had recently just settled there, say in Augusta County and um, Winchester area. These families were now leaving and were traveling further south. So this is a prime example of the reason why. During these war years, alternate routes were cut through Virginia, especially from uh, Roanoke going south. As the families made their way to the Big Salt Lick along Staten River, they crossed through the Staten Gap along the Blue Ridge, not far from the little town that I mentioned earlier of Daleville. Many historians are proclaiming that Hickey's Road, and I'm going to spell this, is H-I-C-K-E-Y-S, near Smith River, is part of the Great Wagon Road. The project, um, the volunteers with the project have, have proven that this is not part of it. John Hickey, who operated a store in 1748, and he and several families settled around his store. 
in this area. This is in southern Virginia, not far from the Mayo River. It's more over near the Smith River area. Many families settled in this time period. A road was petitioned during 1749, and it now runs along present-day Highway 57. I think portions of it run into uh, Highway 40. I believe that the road that was petitioned in 1749 was originally a part of a military route, and I'm going to explain to you why. And I think this route occurred during King George's War and that it traveled to two specific uh, forts, and that was Fort Mayo and Fort Blackwater. If you'd like to learn more of the history about these two forts, I urge you to look online. There's plenty of information in historical sites that will guide you to their history. So if you have families, this is my main point that I'm getting here. If you have families that are migrating between 1748 and, say, 1760, it is very, very likely, and if they migrated way all the way into North Carolina, it's very likely that if they needed supplies in this particular area after crossing Stanton River and leaving out of Roanoke and traveling through the Great Wagon Road, they would have stopped at this particular store owned by John Hickey. He was the last known stop until for very for a long many many miles for many many years so it's very likely if they needed anything they would have stopped there are there records uh, available to search through hickey's uh john hickey's documents yes they are and i would encourage everyone to check with the library of uh, virginia you might be surprised um Ron Shell says, very true. Adam Sherrill didn't stay in Virginia very long either. Yes. And I think, you know, it's not to say that King George's War um, contributed to all of the families leaving and making their way into North Carolina. But it is important to remember that um, the land office in North Carolina opened in 1745. But I think with the militia drafting men, um, and, you know, and several men not wanting to go to war, not wanting to go to battle and wanting to stay on their properties, provide for their families and just continue to live with their, you know, their lives did, was not. They were very discouraged with the onset of war. I think it would have been an incentive for them to pick up and move along the Great Wagon Road and other routes to North Carolina and further south. The road as it crossed the North Carolina border first came across the Dan River settlement. This is located in northern sections of Stokes County, North Carolina. In northern sections, it spans over into northern sections of Rockingham County. It was first settled around 1747, 1748. And then the Town Fork settlement, which would have been a little bit further south along the Dan River and this settlement was settled around approximately about the same time. The road continued south and slightly west until it joined the uh, Trader's Path at the Yakin River or present-day Salisbury, Rowan County. And like I said, the land office opened in South uh, North Carolina in 1745. The trading path ran from, because I know I might get questions on that. What is the trade? Okay, the trading path ran from Fort Henry in Petersburg, Virginia, to North Carolina, and it connected with the old Kiowa Trail of the Catawbas and Cherokee Native Americans. Um, I think it was last year. It may have been the year before. I did a whole um, segment, I think it was on Facebook, as a matter of fact, about the Kiwi Trail, and I also wrote several articles concerning the Kiwi Trail. This trail holds a vast amount of history, and it does link and holds ties to the Trader's Path, and eventually going further south into the Great Wagon Road. The Great Wagon Road crossed rough, mountainous terrain, um, especially after crossing the Stanton River. Um, it crossed the Pig River, Urban River, Urban River is known today as um, Smith River, Horse Pasture Creek, Maggotty Creek, and then Mayo River in Virginia. From Roanoke, several roads over the years in the 18th century left from Roanoke from this point. It's as if that once they crossed through Staten Gap, 
Roanoke was the hub, um, central station there, for other roads to branch off from, and this did occur. Um, one of these is, of course, the Wilderness Road. From this route, several other roads emerged, entering into North Carolina. Many people associate the Wilderness Road. Well, this is the road that led into the um, Tennessee and, and later on Kentucky, and it did, most definitely did. But there were other shootouts and, and, and alternate routes that branched off of this Wilderness Road that led into North Carolina. One particular route flows through Carroll County, Virginia through Flower Gap, just north of Cana today. Um, it would kind of be close to Highway 52, but a little bit off to more to the east of present-day Highway 52. We, the actual project and volunteers, we have actually proven this route was a road, definitely a road, in May of 1750. This is in accordance to proof that we uh, found through Christopher Gist, uh, Captain Christopher Gist journal dating to that time period. This was, I think, originally a, um, it led to mining camps and mining villages in the western sections of Virginia. And I think that this uh, original route could have been used in military-wise and then later became part of the migration routes coming into North Carolina leading out of Virginia. Keep in mind, if you're tracing the footsteps of your ancestors, detours were common. They were everywhere. And the roads changed with the seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter, didn't matter. The roads changed. There is also another road that I want to mention that was located in Southern Virginia. It was discovered um, a few, well, I guess a half a year ago, about six months ago now, in the Patrick County area near present-day Claudeville, Virginia, that crossed into North Carolina as early as 1760. So when you're researching your family's footsteps, you want to get your time frame. When did they arrive? When did they leave? And when did they arrive? What was their, where was the origins of their trip? And what was their destination? Okay, I'm now going to um, give you some sources. I'm going to share some sources with you that you can easily look online and learn more about the Great Wagon Road and other routes that your ancestors may have taken. The first source I'm going to share is Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson's map. Um, the online version dates to 1755, and this map shows um, the actual Great Wagon Road, but it also shows the early settlements in all of Virginia, portions of Maryland, uh, southern sections of Pennsylvania, and northern sections of North Carolina. It shows you the waterways as they were known during that time, and it also shows you other routes. The Flower Gap uh, route that I mentioned to you is noted on the Fry Pick Jefferson map. The original map of Fry and Jefferson dates to 1751, but you can find the 1755 copy online if you go to Library of Congress website. And you can zoom it in, you can examine it and study it and research it and learn more about how Virginia was during the, the mid-1750s. Um, another source I'm going to share, I'm going to share this, uh, Alexander Spotswood, which is a portrait of a governor. This is a book by Walter Habakhurst. It was published in 1967, and you can find this book online, free to read, um, this gives you the origins of the Great Wagon Road and how it came into being. Um, and you can find it online free. I think it's at archive.org. The next source I'm going to share is the Westover Manuscripts. These are the actual journals from William Byrd. They were published in 1841, and they can be found online free to research. William Byrd's letters and his journals are filled with details about Southern Virginia, about Southern settle, um, the settlements, early settlements in Virginia, 
certain people that he came across and, and dealt with, communicated with. Um, it goes into details about the waterways, the roads. He William Byrd goes into so much detail. He describes the actual dates of, of how many horse um, trains he would see, pack trains he would see coming down through the Great Wagon Road, and he would count them. He would have his men, there's 300. There's 300 in this train. These are supplies coming back and forth, trading with the Native Americans in South Carolina and in North Carolina during this time. So his letters and journals are fascinating to read if you want to learn more about the roads and what was available. And you could even come across some of your ancestors' names. Another source I'm going to share with you is the Virginia Frontier from 1754 to 1763. This is a very good book published in 1925 by Lewis Knott Kuntz, and that last name is K-O-O-N-T-Z. And you can find this book online, free to use, free to read in its entirety. And it is searchable in, within the book as well. The other source I'm going to share with you is the journals of Dr. Thomas Walker and Captain Christopher Gist. These you are not going to find online, but if you um, take the time out to visit and happen to be in the area of the main library of Virginia, I urge you to get to do this. And um, because they both contain so much detail about Southern Virginia prior to 1750. Um, both of their journal, both of these men wrote excellent journals and documentation for that time period. The next source I'm going to share is the Lancaster Treaty of 1744 from Pennsylvania. This is your real origins of the Great Wagon Road. It was due to that treaty that um, the road was opened up and all the families were allowed to travel on it. There are many stories um, that have been passed down from one generation to another about the people who actually settled along the Great Wagon Road. And I want to say this, you know, the families who traveled during the colonial period, they always lived near a road. They didn't just go out into the wilderness and pick out a spot and put their house up. They, they wanted to be near roads. They wanted to, to be near where they could get market to trade for their items or get supplies. They wanted to be near a road. And... Um, most of them traveled in groups. There were very few um, families who traveled alone. It was dangerous for them to do this. So most majority of them did travel in groups for safety reasons. And they settled in groups for safety reasons near a road. Um, but there are many, many stories that have been passed down from one generation to another about the people who settled along the Great Wagon Road. And some of these have been proven with the Great Wagon Road Project but others have also been disproven. But I believe that, you know, all the stories give the road character. Whether they are true or not, it, it gives the road character. And after all, it takes the people to create the road. And, you know, the Great Wagon Road was, became famous as a migration route because of the people who were using it. And, they, the people, were using it because of its destination, where it went, um, preference of using it versus other roads, such as toll roads, um, and the a chance to settle in areas that have not been settled before. So that's why it was it was pretty famous. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so I am going to um, share a book with all of you right now and this is a book that for years I would when I go to the library I'd say you know re be researching it and I would have to check this book out sometimes it later as the years went by it became a reference book and you can no longer check it out but now I own a copy this is called the loyal light glare okay can you see it loyalist the loyalist in North Carolina during the revolution this is an excellent book by Robert DeMond. Um, spelt the last name is D-E-M-O-N-D. It was first published in 1940. And he really went into deep, deep research on the loyalists who were located within North Carolina. 
and he not only names them, but he goes into detail about their families and how their opinions were during the war and their actions, what they what they were able to accomplish with their actions during the war. Uh, this is a printing that was uh, a recent, more recent printing from Southern Historical Press out of Greenville, South Carolina. And what they did, and they 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 go in the book, when you open it, they'll tell you that this volume was reproduced from a personal copy located in the publisher's private library. And um, so there's, if you get a chance and you, you suspect that you have um, some, or if you suspect that there are family ancestors in North Carolina dated from the American Revolution and you can't find them, maybe they are, they maybe they were a loyalist and you just haven't been able to find their records for them. But it is an excellent book and I highly, highly recommend it. And I'm glad I finally have a copy of that. Okay. I'm looking for more. I don't see any more comments. Okay, so my podcast is coming up on um, this coming Thursday. The name of it is Before 1790. How many of you have um, traced all of your ancestors before 1790? It's fun. It is in all kinds of ways to find your ancestors. And then once you do, it's amazing the details that you come across before 1790. Colonial period is my favorite period of research, uh, 17th and 18th centuries and before. So there are all kinds of records out there, and the podcast is going to go into detail on what records and what techniques you can use the, to help entice you to dig further on your family tree before 1790. 1790 always seems to be the cutoff because of the federal census. But for me, that's just the beginning. <laughs> the journey is just beginning with that 1790 census. Okay, and I've also got an article coming up uh, this coming week. Um, I'm going to be sharing a very important road in North Carolina that very few historians even mention. And I brought it up uh, earlier when I was discussing the Great Wagon Road. So I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it to you. It's the Cape Fear Road. This row was originated in 1754, and that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let the article speak for itself. I'm just about done with it, and then we'll get that published on the website real soon. But I hope to bring um, some very good, significant points to, to people that have never heard of the Cape Fear Road and why it was so important during this time frame in 1754 in North Carolina. So... That's going to be coming up this week. And Brian says, all my lines were here in America well before 1790. Yes, I had quite a few myself well before 1790. And someone was asking me, well, how do you know where to even begin? Well, you start and you work your way back. And you've got to um, look at the families around you, too. That's, I've always said that. If you've got to look at the neighbors and friends. All of our ancestors had neighbors and friends. They all worked together. They all um, harvested crops together. They went to and worshipped at church together. They went to gatherings together. So you've got to look at the family and friends too for the clues and hints in moving forward and, and just start tracing back. But stay tuned. Join the podcast and I'll have it coming out this Thursday. And I'll share some more techniques about how you can follow the footsteps of your ancestors. And it's fun to do before 1790. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all your support. Again, if you have questions about the Great Wagon Road Project or if you'd like a copy of the flyer, just go to uh, PiedmontTrails.com and click the contact page or click Great Wagon Road Project page. And it'll give you all the details that you need to know. And I hope um, all of you enjoy your journey to the past this coming week. And our next segment will be, uh, we're holding these on the last Sunday of each month. So I've got to get my calendar out. Sorry, I didn't have that ready. Bear with me. I've got to go to October. It will be October. Oh, we're not going to do it on Halloween. So we're going to make it October 24th. <laughs> Okay, so it's going to be October 24th at 7.30 p.m. And I'll post it on Facebook and 
I'll post it on YouTube too so that everybody will know. All right, you guys. Hope you have a great week moving forward and enjoy your journey to the past. And God bless.